Hi, this is E.T. An exhibition bout between Roy Jones and Mike Tyson is expected to occur on November 28, 2020. It's expected to cost for pay-per-view about 50 bucks U.S. currency. Is this exhibition fight a good idea? Well, E.T. thinks no. Before exploring that, some facts. No universal rules have evolved for exhibition fights over the past century. These bouts have ranged from wheezing old timers in street clothes, dancing and holding for several minutes, after which they'd belly up to the bar for whiskey. They've ranged from that to very in shape boxers brought together by deep pocketed gamblers for serious competition before a small audience. Also, these exhibitions may or may not have required headgear, gloves, referees, or timed rounds. Now, some examples of boxing exhibitions uh, that were never intended to do more than uh, entertain or make money include Floyd Mayweather Jr. versus a Japanese martial arts enthusiast. What was his name? Nasakawa or Nasakawa? And then there was seven foot, seven inch Manute Ball, who fought, and I use that word loosely, 330 pound William Refrigerator Perry. And then more seriously, George Foreman in 1975 took on five separate opponents in one afternoon. And then going back to, I think it was 1910, Jack Johnson took on Victor McLaughlin. McLaughlin was a club fighter out of Canada. He and Johnson met in Vancouver. Now, McLaughlin later went on to become a popular film actor. His most famous role was Squire Will Danaher in the movie um, The Quiet Man. He fought John Wayne in that movie. That was the longest uninterrupted uh, cinema fight until Roddy Roddy Piper grappled with actor Keith David in the movie They Live. A little footnote to that footnote. After the Johnson exhibition fight, McLaughlin would be assigned as assistant provost marshal in the city of Baghdad. Baghdad was the location of the first known boxing matches in antiquity. That was where they wrapped their fists with leather straps. Anyway, back to Tyson versus Jones and why E.T. thinks it's a bad idea. Reason number one, that it's a bad idea. It appears that Tyson, and perhaps Jones too, may intend to actually fight though the steamed rhetoric between the two may be intended to simply bring in more viewers and thus more money. But even if the pre-exhibition chatter is merely hype, there is a chance that one or both of these former champions may forget any pre-arrangement to go easy and instead, after the first punch is thrown, try to KO the other. Reason number two, that this is a mismatch. Jones showed his boxing magic for only a relatively short time, and that at middleweight, although he did fight later as a light heavy cruiser and heavyweight, and he did win a decision against John Ruiz for the, I think it was WBA heavyweight title, and previous to that, he won a light heavy title against and who was it? Clinton Jones. But after the 2003 win against Ruiz, Jones, following a dramatic weight loss, which is always a disaster. I'm going to put up a video about weight loss at the end of this one, so keep with me. Anyway, after that weight loss, Jones lost three fights in a row, two of those by knockout, and he was never the same fighter again. It was apparent that Jones had lost 
his previous speed and coordination, and those two things are the first to go with age. And without defensive skills, which in better days Jones never had to learn because of his lightning speed and preternatural coordination, he, Jones, is, in my opinion, vulnerable. And Tyson, Tyson has, is a natural heavyweight, and he has retained his punching power. That is the last thing to go, albeit he displays his power in limited bursts. And it appeared to me, at least, that his losses to Lennox Lewis, uh, Danny Williams, and Kevin McBride appeared to be the result more of absence of enthusiasm than a, a, a deterioration of fighting skill. Whatever, if the recent film of Tyson in training is reflective of his hand speed and power, then the recipient of his punch faces serious hurt. Reason number three why it's a bad idea. Both Tyson and Jones are old. Tyson is 54, Jones 51, and thus each is more susceptible to brain trauma. Now, brain trauma appears in two forms, either A as a KO concussion, resulting in a hematoma, that's where blood builds up in the skull, and then the brain is squeezed and the uh, fighter will suffer massive brain damage or death. Examples are Obeni Kitparet. He died in the 1960s, I believe early 60s, after being KO'd by Emil Griffith. And then more recently, Gerald McClellan suffered severe damage and he's still living. That was after his fight with uh, Nigel Ben. And then B, there is encephalopathy. That is the punch drunk syndrome, usually coming from being hit not just once, but thousands of times. The examples of those with this syndrome are way too many to list here. But some of the more famous names include uh, Muhammad Ali, the Quarry brothers, uh, Jerry and Mike, uh, the Moyer brothers, Dennis and Phil, Archie Moore, Sugar Ray Robinson. The list would go on for hours. Former heavyweight champion Sonny Liston put it this way, and I'm quoting Liston. See, all the brains are in a sort of cup, and after you get hit a few times, it shakes them out of that cup. It's when the brains get shook up and run together that you get punch drunk, unquote. Susceptibility to either form of brain damage increases with age. Now, I'm putting up now, do you see it? A 2008 National Institute of Health study that concluded, and I'm quoting, older patients show greater decline over the first five years after a traumatic brain injury than do younger patients. Additionally, the greatest amount of improvement in disability was observed among the youngest group of survivors. Now, this is not the only study that proved what fighters and trainers, as well as casual observers, already knew. Unfortunately, those in positions of influence in the boxing field, people who know better, have for years denied the obvious and they've put fighters at risk for what I assume to be financial gain, much as did the tobacco CEOs and their hired scientific goons when they insisted that smoking tobacco was harmless. In fact, they said it was healthy. Now, here's what Charles P. Larson said. Larson was former head of the World Boxing Association. Here's what he said about punch drunk syndrome. And I'm quoting Larson. I don't think I have ever really seen an individual who has gone into professional boxing with normal intelligence who wound up suffering from the so-called punch drunk syndrome. Most fighters who were classified as such really had only low-level intelligence to begin with. 
Oh, my Lord. Such remarks as Larson's are, to put it politely, disingenuous. And unfortunately, many people in positions of authority within the boxing communities continue to repeat this lie. The point is this. A. Exhibitions are not conducted according to rules of governing bodies. And they can begin as a light dance, but progress into something deadly, especially with a known volatile fighter such as Mike Tyson. And B. Head blows result in brain damage, and aging brains are more susceptible. C. Roy Jones whose previous ring assets were his lightning speed and coordination, has never fought someone with Tyson's still formidable power. And he could possibly incur serious damage and possibly death should this exhibition develop into a serious fight. This fight should be, in my opinion, called off now. But that's just me. What do you think? Put your comments in below. If you like this video, hit the like button. Mr. YouTube will make these videos more available if it receives likes. And finally, if you have not done so, subscribe to this channel. Thank you.